this one too. Right. Thank you so much, Albert, for this really nice demonstration. Okay, so um, we're going to take a little bit of a break, meaning like you are not going to go out, but uh, it's time for you all to talk, right? So it's, it's been like uh, for the last so many hours, it's been uh, presenters who's coming all the way, uh, coming to the stage and presenting, but uh, you all in the audience were very keenly listening. So this is the time for you all to ask questions. So let us try to reflect on what we have discussed from the morning. So in the morning, what we tried to do in the opening session was to give you an idea. What is DHS2? What has DHS2 been used for in other countries? And primarily, like what has been done with DHS2 in the health sector. And then uh, we also learned and listened to some of the reflections from uh, a very high level about like, uh, what does it mean when we talk about EMIS data? And then just before the lunch break, uh, we were able to listen to some of the uh, uh, I mean really nice insights coming from the school level, from uh, principals as well as provincial levels, right? And then after the lunch break, now we have seen two demos, uh, one on attendance and another one on how to use dashboards. So with all that, what I would ask from you all in the audience, as well as all the, all, all the participants who are listening to us online, what we have discussed so far, do they address some of the queries you have encountered over the years in using education data? If not, should we change our agenda, for, uh, for example? Or else, like, we are, we are flexible. We, we can improvise a bit, and we can focus more on areas that you think will be very necessary uh, in the present context. So uh, let me open um, uh, and let me take a few questions from you all in the audience. What are the issues you have encountered uh, from your routine uh, working context? Right? We are, here we have some participants from the schools, some from the provincial level, and many from the Ministry of Education. What are the main challenges related to education data you have encountered? And um, you can also ask some questions based on some of the presentations we have conducted so far. Are there any immediate questions? Do we have any questions from, uh, from online participants? Yes, we have a question from Chipo. Yes. Could you please? Uh, Thank you so much. I have two questions. One is kind of general for the use cases, and the other one is uh, specific. So I will start with the specific one. Uh, my name is Chipo. I'm from Malawi. Thank you. Uh, there was a presentation which shows number of teachers present, numbers of teachers absent, etc. And I was wondering, is there a way of knowing who specifically, uh, whether a, a teacher is consistently absent uh, and uh, maybe take some action or it just gives the, the numbers? For the more general question, uh, we've uh, been presented with a number of uh, use cases, but most of them, if not all of them, are targeting a specific functionality within the education sector. Uh, do we, by any chance, have uh, a use case, as is the case in health, where it handles all the different aspects of health, uh, whether it's aggregate or the, the, the tracker side, but covering all the aspects of education? That would include the enrollment, the attendance, and all the other functionalities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's really nice question. So uh, maybe for the first one on attendance, uh, Jerry or Halifa. Um, okay. So um, for the attendance, um, because we have uh, head teachers, uh, we have a log sheet that uh, in individual teachers come and then sign on that. So based on that, they will know those that are present and then those that are absent. So based on that, that's the number that they normally send. 
So at the national or at the national or regional level, we for now we are interested in the numbers. That is just to monitor the numbers because most um, we know the number of um, teachers that are in the school already. So based on those numbers, we will know that you have a certain number that is absent. And then if you want to go further, we can call the school head or go down to the school and then get that information of the teachers that are absent. Okay. Yeah, that's the approach uh, which is currently being followed. Uh, does that answer your question? So I, th yeah, I think like, uh, uh, so that's, that's, that's the approach they are using. But certainly technology is available. I think it's more about contextualizing the requirement and to also deal with this problem with the limited resources we have. But maybe in a stepwise implementation in years to come, we may be able to do something like a drilling down. So we will we'll be able to understand which specific teacher who has been constantly absent. So for the second question, uh, who wants to take that question? It's more about uh, we are mostly catering individual functions or individual, so Kenut, yes, I think. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I, th I, think, I think your question is, is there an example of a country that has covering the whole gamut, uh, whole wide range of, <clears throat> excuse me, use cases. Um, I guess maybe not quite yet. We're still, all the countries that are using DHS for education have slight variations now. So, so we will, um, but I think the, the ones that are getting closest are, are still the Gambia, where they are, in addition to what was presented this morning, uh, they also have been working quite extensively on, on adding individual students and teachers. And then, well, daily attendance for each of them is, of course, something that is, is done. The question is, well, do you put that in the national system or, or is, are there other priorities uh, for the national system, such as performance, uh, or, or you know, socioeconomic factors, or dropout. Well, dropout is of course very linked to, very much linked to absence and, and, and uh, attendance. But so, so um, unfortunately, the very short answer to your question is no. We we have so many things that we are already able to do with DHS2 for education that there is not one country that has implemented all of them yet. But we're getting there very rapidly. Um, so it's kind of the, the total sum of all the activity that we're doing in different countries adds up to a total that is quite comprehensive. Although the big thing that we are really um, in a way struggling with is to define, uh, and it depends on each country, to define exactly what should DHS2 do as opposed to like a school level system. And I, uh, I heard, I mean, just from some conversation in the breaks here with, you know, if there is a big school in the capital, well resourced, uh, 4,000, 5,000 students, they probably have an IT staff even within the school. So they can run different types of software. Um, that is extremely different than a small rural school, you know, 100 students or maybe uh, 10 teachers or five teachers, um, uh, no internet, uh, very little access to, even, even, even power might be an issue, could be, you know, seasonal issues. Um, what can we support, how can we support those schools to be inclusive, also give them something that is useful at their level, which will probably not be, you know, five kinds of software, but still something that can actually, you know, be of, hel of help to them, but also to their local administrators, the ones that take care of their zone or district, and, uh, and, and of course feeds data up to the national level as well. Because again, typically, and I, I don't want to single out any particular country, but typically the ministry would know more about you know, the main schools, the schools in the cities and the schools that have resources 
they would have more knowledge about those than these remote schools where you maybe hear from them once a year, um, roughly. Um, so that's why I, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in, uh, tomorrow morning, but that's why I mentioned these, these dimensions of expansion. So we really want DHS2 to support ministries and countries in, in providing services in a way to or manage the services at the school level because we know that's where the action is. Um, sometimes it's not really feasible at the school level, so you go to the that district level. I mean, you, you get, you still continue paper reporting between the school, school and the district for a certain while, or, or you collect data um, less frequently, you, uh, or, the, or the person actually brings data to the zonal office, for example. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So, so it's really what is feasible and different. Our main concern is this inclusivity and, and, and uh, adding, adding um, useful services, increasing their frequency from annual census to something that is maybe termly, maybe monthly, maybe weekly. And of course, it could eventually be sort of real time. But then you, you definitely need to have good IT support. Um, and you have, to, you have to consider the training as well, right? Because if, if, you, if you expect people to do a lot in the system, then they probably need more training. So, so there's a cost uh, involved if, you, if you're going to te train all the head teachers, that's one cost. If you want to train all the teachers, then you multiply by at least 10, probably maybe 100, right? The, just the cost of training. Uh, and and support. So this is a very long answer to you. <laughs> and I would very much like to continue that conversation of what do we currently support? What should we support? There is, you know, there's no limit to what you could support. Like we could do a learning management information system where, you know, every time a student finishes a homework, they upload to the server and the teacher can correct and send you a message uh, and the parent can get a message that you did your homework. I mean, there are many, many things that are being done in the, and, and, and of course there's a lot of things that pro software that teaches you math and algebra, but we will not do that part in DHS2. DHS2 is more about the administrative part, but there might be need for some kind of data exchange with those kinds of systems as well. Okay, I think I'll stop there, but I'm sure there might be other questions in the same way. Right, thank you, Kenut. So we have a question from Patrick Walugembe, uh, who's online participants. So uh, he has a comment and a question for uh, Monica. So uh, the question and the comment goes as, very good insights, Monica. What is your comment on the poor data use culture across all levels, for example, national, subnational, etc., in Africa? What has worked to motivate or change this? Hope you got the question, Monica. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pamud, and thank you, Patrick, once again for sharing that uh, question. I think it's very. Um, Important. I, I think really what has been the limiting factor to data use in uh, most of our countries has been the traditional way in which data has been collected. Because I think like earlier we said, most of the time data has been collected from school level right up to the central level. And um, more often it hasn't been disseminated back to the school or at the subnational level. So there's been really limited use, or if it was disseminated, it was in form of a hard copy book or a PDF book that was very hard really to drill down and see where the local problem is and address it. So I think with such um, 
systems which are very flexible that allow access to, to data at, across all the different levels, then this is able to motivate that culture of data use at that lower level because they are able to visualize their data. They are able to tease out all these key indicators and see how they are performing and then respond to to where the, really the gaps and challenges are. So this kind of like mixing the system and also the capabilities of the system. And we talk in the school managers to analyze this data, to extract the data. And even the, um, the, the presentation from the Gambia team on, you know, uh, real-time feedback to the school administrators I think is really powerful because with once you give them real-time feedback then they can be able to act on their data and they see that you value them instead of just picking data and sending it to the center so I think that's very important thank you All right thank you so much Monica so the poor culture of data use is not uh, restricted to one country. I think all our countries are having the same issue. And we can discuss more about it uh, during our networking sessions, maybe over coffee breaks, tea breaks, which uh, I think uh, as uh, what, what we all learned is very important and uh, uh, really important aspect of all these uh, sessions. All right. So with that, we are moving on to the final session of the day, which will be on cross-sector linkages. Thanks, everyone. So earlier today, we have heard a little bit about um, some reflections on how can we combine and have joint, uh, de joint, de joint collaboration uh, between different ministries. But uh, for this session, we're going to hear a few more case, uh, case studies where we go a little bit more deeper into those um, into cross-sector work. Um, and to kick us off, I would like to welcome and say thank you very much to the Director of Education, Ms. Rushika Diaz from Save the Children, Sri Lanka. We were talking a little bit earlier with the Honorable State Minister about partnerships. And I think what we've been able to see is that the Save the Children has been such an important partner here to the ministry and we've seen across the world with many ministries. So we really welcome you and are looking forward to hearing from you today. So. Please give, uh, help me walk, uh, welcome Ms. Rishika.